All right, thank you to everyone for joining us for the historical fiction panel. My name is Samuel Hale, and I am joined today by Jacobo de la Quercha, Arnaud Brocking, and Olga Panier. And we are going to be talking about historical fiction, going about writing it, pitfalls, research, and so on. So we're going to get right into it. So question number one, and Arnaud, you are going to begin here. Are there rules when it comes to writing historical fiction? Are there rules? Um, I would say there's one rule that I adhere to, and that would be to be conscious of what you're writing and why you're writing it. I don't necessarily agree always that historical fiction has to be exact or that um, you can't change things but you have to know why you're changing things and it has to have a function within um, within the story and i think if you treat your story and the characters with respect then uh, i think that that's mo mostly the the main rule that that i adhere to uh, it also depends on context if you're writing say a novel about uh, vincent van gogh then you have a few more liberties than if um, you say you you write for the museum like like we did and we had to write about his relationship with his brother then you have to be more historically correct and it could also it got checked by a certain group of specialists whether uh, whether it was all a-okay so the context may, it makes a difference but in in rules it's know what you're writing why you're writing and uh, but while you're writing it, yeah, treat your story and the characters and the humans within it with respect. I think that would be my sole rule. That's a good point about context. If it's something like you're writing for a museum, obviously historical accuracy is tantamount. But if you're writing something that's fictitious, deciding that you're going to take certain liberties, the context is really important. And like you were saying as well, just... and. Uh, in a previous panel, uh, Yakbo made a similar point, which is if you're going to make certain changes, you need to be able to explain why. And I think you make a really good point there, Arnau. Thank you. Next, Olha, are there rules when it comes to writing historical fiction? Well, I think I'm agreeing with Arnau on, on this. Uh, I think respect and consciously knowing whose story you're telling is really important, why you're why you want to tell it, of course. I think in the past, I took a lot of liberties with this and I just thought, well, this is really exciting history and I want to talk about it and I can write whatever character I want. But as I get older and as a society, we're getting more conscious about whose stories we're hearing and whose stories we're not hearing. I think I also tend to try to understand whose story you're telling and if you're in the place of telling that story. And I think um, in, in screenwriting, um, a couple of years back, we saw the terror. And I think I, I, I read a bit about how they researched it and how they treated the characters. And that was really interesting because they said, we want to create certain conflicts and we need certain bad guys for mm -hmm. the story, or at least well, people who are a bit more uh, centered on themselves than the people around them. But they said you, you can just go back in time, uh, look at a list of names of people who were on these ships, just choose one and make them a villain. Because, <laughs> you know, those, those families are still around and we don't know who these people were. So who are we to, to judge them <laughs> from, from our place here? So they said we, we took all all characters. It's about uh, these two ships who are exploring um, a north passage uh, around America, and they get stuck in the ice. So they um, they they said for for all uh, the other cap the captains and just the boat mates and all all sort of normal characters, they they took like historical persons and tried to research them as much as possible. But for the villains, they said. We just don't want to burden, in re retrospect, mm. these people we don't know about. And I thought it was a really interesting point. In uh, I, I, I never looked at it that way. And um, I think uh, since that time, I also try to be conscious about 
well, you know, it is historical fiction. Uh, it's fiction, but it's still about mostly about people who live before us and that we should treat with with respect as if they were living today. So I think uh, I, I agree with uh, the respect rule. Did you uh, have a chance to read the book by Dan Simmons, The Terror? No, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't read that one. Oh, it's great. Um, he went from <laughs> writing huge sprawling operatic sci-fi like the hyperion cantos yes yeah and yes, i've read that book. Oh, yes, yes. incredible <laughs> books yeah i highly recommend it. it's a, i would say it's actually about 100 pages too long but it's an excellent read and i uh, highly recommend it to historical fiction fans readers and writers out there i haven't watched the show yet i'm getting around to it i will watch it eventually yeah it's really uh... I, th I thought it was really nice. It's about, and I'm saying this as a woman, but it's, it's about <laughs> the, the, the sense of brotherhood. And, yeah. and I always thought about these ships, it must be horrible to be aboard with 300 guys. Mm -hmm. and, but it, there's a sense of camaraderie there that, I don't know, it was, it was really ni nicely done, I think. Yeah. His description in the book of scurvy and the smell of people's teeth falling out in the yeah. rotting gums. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that alone is worth a read. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Oha. All right. Jacobo, same question goes to you. Are there rules when it comes to writing historical fiction? I think the most basic rule is that, um, <clears throat> well, it not take place in uh, a contemporaneous time when the book is written and that it somehow use its history. Because I, I was you know, thinking about everybody's answers when it comes to this. And I was really trying to test in my imagination what is a historical fiction, what is not a historical fiction. So a book that takes place when it takes place, like, for example, I was thinking of Dr. Strangelove. Hmm. I don't consider Dr. Strangelove a historical fiction, even though in retrospect, it is clearly a product of its era hmm. in the early 1960s Cold War. And we could even view it as an, a historical artifact of the United States Air Force during that time in history. But even though it very much uses history, it uses history at the present or even in the sort of imagined science fiction-y future that it is. Because it is technically a science fiction. It, the Doomsday Machine is mm -hmm. a work of science fiction. Now, even if you get a story and you said it's several years earlier, I'm not 100% convinced if it's a historical fiction in that case, depending on how it uses history. For example, No Country for Old Men took place in, uh, I believe, 1981, a few decades before it was written. But in my opinion, even though it takes place in that setting, it seems to me much more like a Western. And Westerns, by default, usually take place in a past. And sometimes they use history, sometimes they, they do not. I could be convinced that No Country for Old Men is a historical fiction, but my gut is telling me that it's not because I feel it doesn't use history enough to warrant it as being anything differently than just, you know, part of the setting. But when it comes to, say, um, uh, when it comes to, say, Moby Dick, Moby Dick doesn't really specify when it takes place, but it does acknowledge significant events historically that have taken place before it. So for that reason... I feel that because it uses history as part of the major narrative in the story and how it's clearly the product of immense uh, historical research, I feel that Moby Dick was meant to take place in a sort of nebulous past that is well researched and very and, you know, does have that sort of substructure of history that adds to the world building. So in all those cases, I think that you can see that if history is part of the storytelling, I would consider it a historical fiction or part of the world building. I totally agree with you. And I think that uh, coming back to No Country for Old Men, whether it's the novel or the Coen Brothers film, it, like you said, it doesn't really utilize history as a plot device or a setting as a character. And it really is almost autonomous. Like, even though the cars, the clothing, the set design, definitely establishes that this is early 80s something to that effect it is still autonomous in a sense it, they don't really show phones there's no computer shown or anything like that it's not relevant to the plot therefore it doesn't need to be um, really shown or anything like that certain films really do make an effort to make these autonomous 
bubble and time films and i think no country is definitely one of those novel slash films additionally kind of coming back to dr strange love i agree with you and i think it's almost satirical in a way i think that it has this element of satire in a film that it reminded me of which is relatively recent film that came out it's called the death of stalin in 2017 which has a really great cast and it is essentially just a dark comedy about the death of Stalin and it just I can't quite articulate why but it popped into my head when you mentioned Dr. Strange. It's a masterpiece that's why. Yes that's why. Masterpieces of satire. Yeah exactly there's some great moments uh, that I don't want to spoil but the fact that the death of Stalin starring people like Steve Buscemi they don't do any Russian accents. They just talk like they normally would. It's probably one of the best parts of the film. Great film. Actually, one thing I do want to specify, and um, History Buff did a fantastic video on this. They said that they actually use different types of English accents as a way of underscoring how the United, how the Soviet Union was this enormous country, mm. like the size of a continent. And they said that's the reason why it actually makes sense that you would have, you know, Michael Palin speaking with his English accent and how, like, they even said how the actor who plays Stalin has a Cockney accent. Mm. and uh, He's the, a Georgian. Um, yeah, exactly. They're emphasizing how, you know, he's like a little bit of the outsider in yep. there. So, like I said, there is a video online by uh, Mike Hodges called History Buffs on Death of Stalin. Watch it. It is fantastic. I have to watch that. I didn't know that was out there. All right. So... Olha, let's start with you for our next question here. There's a myriad of historical fiction based on the late medieval period, things similar to Game of Thrones, for example, and the early mm -hmm. modern era, the 16th century. Why do you think this is the case? Why do we see a sudden kind of popping up of all these novels and shows, films that are depicting this era? Well, I think this is a really interesting point because I was also talking with Arnaud about this um, because we were looking uh, in, in, in Dutch media uh, if there's the same trend and we don't see the, the same thing here. Hmm. So I'm also really curious to hear because in English speaking countries, I assume this, this is a huge thing. But um, when I speak purely from the Netherlands, it seems like we have an obsession with other time periods. So. This is really fascinating to me. Why, why, why is this the case? Because when I'm just looking um, here in the Netherlands, we make a lot about Second World War. That's like every year there's a movie coming out and we make like, I think, 11 movies a year <laughs> <laughs> for comparison. So there's not a lot of movies coming out, just Dutch spoken movies, but at least one or two of them are about the Second World War. So. It's an obsession. We just we, we can't leave this behind. Why do you and think that same is? And the same goes for the yeah. I was I was thinking about it because the second thing is the 17th century. That's what we call the golden age. Hmm. But well, the, the golden is well. We're in a national discussion about this, but it's the time when we uh, did our first colonial expeditions. Uh, we had the VOC, which was uh, sort of the trading company who went uh, overseas. And they were really good at slavery and mm. opium selling and those sort of things. But it's still called the golden age here because that's what, when our country got rich. And a lot of historical fiction here is about that time. So we don't have this late medieval period obsession or the 16th century, but the late the 17th century is is huge here. So I'm thinking, what's the what's what's this what's this thing? Uh, why? why this obsession with certain eras of the history? And I think in, in Holland, it has a lot to do with pride, I think. National pride, not always the good kind of pride, I think. <laughs> because a lot of the Second World War movies are about uh, the rebellion, how we fought against the Germans, uh, how we were secretly all heroes. And the same goes for the golden age when we were the explorers and made a lot of money and brought back exotic spices and things. While there aren't as much movies or media about the dark sides of these two eras, because, well, the golden age is also the time when we did a lot of damage to a lot of cultures. Mm. And the Second World War, well, Holland was known for really being efficient in writing documents and 
working with <laughs> the Germans. Right. So yeah, so it's 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 a double double thing, but I think it's it's the times when we see ourselves as a bit of heroes in history, I think, mm -hmm. or at least like to see ourselves in that way. Yeah, I just learned about that recently about the um, level of detail in the record keeping amongst the Dutch during World War II. I hadn't realized that it was so meticulous. That was uh, yeah. interesting to me. This is something I've always found interesting because it's such a simple thing, yet it dominated trade in the 1600s. Have you kind of dived into the Dutch tulip trade or it was called like tulip mania that happened in uh, the 1600s? Oh, the tulip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tulip mania. I found that really interesting. I, it, it's kind of like carp or herring or salt. It's this really, today mm. we would look at it as something so simple and matter of fact, but a flower or a spice or a type of fish has a massive effect on world history. And I'd recommend people reading a book called Salt. I can't remember the author's name. And I'm kind of hoping that he'll do something about the Dutch tulip, too, because it has this yeah, massive yeah. effect on the world in terms of uh, commerce. It's uh, insane. It's There's so much similarities mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. between that period and our economic crash of 2007. Yes. We create, we Dutch, if we want to be prideful about something, we created the first economic bubble that That's right. led to a similar, the first economic crisis of the world. So it's... Uh, but yeah, that's, that sort of thing is not general knowledge here. So it's general knowledge that we were heroes in the Second World War and that we were explorers, but it's not common knowledge that, well, we also had this first huge economic crash with <laughs> tulip mania or something. So yeah, it's really, we're sort of leaving out certain bits of history, I, I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little selective history. It's a cool feather to have yeah. in your cap, though, the first economic bubble that popped in recorded world history. So, you know, you can have that one. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really, I'm really interested how I think Arnaud lived in uh, Belgium, uh, so the country that's below the, Netherl the Netherlands. And I'm, so I'm really interested in why there's such different uh, periods of obsession, it seems, in different cultures. Mm -hmm. My podcast has a ton of Belgium fans, specifically in Brussels, and I will put it out to them because I have the same question myself. All right, Jacobo, same question for you. There's this fascination with late medieval period and the early modern era, the 16th century. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, there's several reasons for it, or at least several reasons I can address. Uh, one of them is definitely we have such a wealth of history from that time period, including historical fiction, because this is when writing for many parts of the world were being rediscovered. We have the Song of we have the Song of Roland, the Death of Arthur, and so we were able to use that as sort of and the Canterbury Tales, of course. So, at least in the English-speaking world, we have this fantastic bedrock of our own culture, our own understanding of the language that we can be basing upon and as well as works that have been written or translated from that time period that we can turn to for inspiration. And another reason is because uh, with respect to historiography, uh, which for anyone listening doesn't know, historiography is the history of history. <laughs> Basically, how historians have written about certain periods from history, usually during a period of anniversaries, such as um, the poet Dante, he just died um, 700 years ago the other day. Usually during an anniversary year, that's when many historians reassess certain figures from history. That's the reason why all these books come out on this one subject. Everyone's talking about President Grant. Everyone's talking about the sinking of the Titanic. Everyone's talking about Teddy Roosevelt all of a sudden. Hmm. And in many cases, it is part of a trend within history within the historical community, I should say. And that popularity leads to things such as a Broadway success on Alexander Hamilton. That itself was a product of um, the book Alexander Hamilton that had just come out. But um, another reason, though, is it is a little bit of a chicken and the egg aspect when it comes to modern popular culture, because it does go back and forth. There is now... For example, there's all these videos you can find on YouTube where they're interviewing experts on um, medieval military 
technology or on sword fighting, all these experts are now getting more attention because people who saw Game of Thrones or are playing The Witcher or whatever, they're turning to them for advice. So I do think that because of social media, it is going back and forth and back and forth where basically when it comes to some of the uh, consumable media, such as books or Game of Thrones, there's only so many Game of Thrones books. There's only so many episodes of the show. And naturally, fans are insatiable. They want more. So what do you do? You turn to the histories of the War of the Roses. You turn to other writers who are authoring similar books. And no disrespect to him, but maybe a faster pace than George R. R. Martin. <laughs> no disrespect to him, of course. So he was no. a very, very, very nice man. But um, yeah, that's how I do feel. I do feel that right now, it, it, it really is like a metronome going back and forth between the historians influencing the writers and them now his, influencing the historians. I just feel that rapidly because of social media and the wide disperse of um, means for amusing oneself through historical fiction or through history, I feel like that metronome is now moving at a more rapid tempo, mm -hmm. which is exciting. It's a good time to have been one of those people who, you know, got a history major during your undergrad. I really am happy to hear you describe the metronome effect, essentially, because I always, I, I turn it upside down. I always think of it as a pendulum, but it's the same thing, which is that uh, with any kind of trend, it suddenly is in and then it's back out. Maybe like in the literary world, and it seems like the the pendulum has swung over to this side of uh, young adult fiction, for example, and it's hung out there for quite some time. I'm kind of wondering if or when it's going to swing back the other direction. So seeing well, the same thing to... happen with hist uh, historical fiction, it's been interesting. Go ahead. Well, I just want to say that things like this have happened in history before. I mean, in the 1950s, we had all these movies coming out that were biblical epics. Yeah. It's not because people were reading the Bible all of a sudden. It's because, you know, a select group of several dozen or several hundred people in the entertainment industry were making a lot of these movies and guess what if you're making a bible epic you can reuse a lot of the costumes you can reuse a lot of the sets <laughs> uh you already have established actors like charlton heston who are playing characters from those time periods so there are many different trends that are involved and even when it comes to like say um in uh, literature like the da vinci code was really a product of um that one book holy blood holy grail in the 1980s and sort of like uh that early version of conspiracy, basically that pre-internet, pre-QAnon conspiracy <laughs> niche that was being satisfied through like Chariots of the Gods and the Illuminatus Trilogy, all that kind of stuff. Before the internet, there was that. <laughs> and I really feel that the Da Vinci Code was a product of a lot of that, um, that hotbed for conspiracy theorizing and everything like that. And of course, the X-Files, Twin Peaks and all that. So this has happened historically it's even happened before that if we were to go to the 19th century but as i said i do think and i'm pretty sure the figures will back me up that because of social media and basically because of the uncontrollable nature of consumerism right now in the sense that audiences are larger than ever before due to covid people are reading a lot more they're watching tv more they're streaming more i do feel that that relationship is much more rapid and a little bit more amorphous than it was in uh, previous decades couldn't agree more with you absolutely are now uh same question to you there is a surge in historical fiction based in late medieval period 16th century in particular it seems like why do you think this is the case first of all i think uh, that there's two excellent answers before me i can speculate on why specifically late medieval period but this would be mostly speculation from my side and because i have the feeling and i don't know how it is over um, on your side of the ocean but on this side at least um, the times here people are um, nostalgia is a large influencer as in a lot of people like um, nostalgic stories stories that somehow harken back to it what seems to be easier or more understandable time where um, it was um, simpler to know what you could do or what you had to do and in that regard the late medieval period seems 
to the untrained because we have this we have this sort of romanticized version yeah, absolutely. of it and i think that's why it's, it's very poignant that you pick um sort of game of thrones as as an example as because game of thrones in in part is also it's a fantasy and it's a fantasy story i think a large part of what we nowadays see as the late medieval period crosses over with the fantasy genre and and we have this romanticized idea of that and because we are so nostalgia is so important for a lot of people at this point in time that seems like a very attractive period and i believe but I'm not quite sure, but I believe that nostalgia at that time was also important um, because the whole, um, the chivalric code and um, the whole courtly love and the the grail, um, the grail saga with um, all the virtuous knights, they, they were all, nostalgia was, was a large part for them. So it, I find it interesting to see that it, that it returns in certain cycles. Mm-hmm. And, and in that in that regard, I agree with the with the metronome or the pendulum comparison. Um, I think the 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 example that you gave of uh, the 1950s and the biblical times is also is also that same sort of nostalgia, a sort of simplified, idealized version of a time that you that sort of exists in a in a wider conscience, but it didn't really exist. <laughs> in history yeah. and, and i think that 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 there's a real appetite for for that for the fantasy version of the late the late medieval time before the world got too complex and when it, when it was yeah somehow clearer right. for people i think i think that that is part of it i also want to get back to uh, what olga, olga said that it matters in which country you are or in which culture you are what is popular at this at the time or what is popular in general uh, because I did, I did live in Belgium for 15 or 20 years, and one of the great things that I noticed, even though it's only 150, 180 kilometers south of where we live now, is that there is an immense difference in not only the way people are, but also which kind of fiction they like and which kind of stories they tell, and also which periods they tell stories about. So, for example, I, I wrote a story uh, that was set in the First World War, which is perfect within a Belgian context because that war left such scars in the countryside there. It left scars in the Belgian psyche that it it's still very relevant. Yeah, it's still very relevant for people for people living there to there um, today, and and mm-hmm. it still it still resonates with people, and it still says something about what kind of a country it is, what its own history is, which is, I mean, Belgian history is fascinating because it's been, it's been everything. It's been part of just about every other country <laughs> in, in Europe at some point, but it, it, it's always had its own, had, had its own flavor. And now I live in Holland and Holland was neutral or stay, stayed out of the First World War. So the First World War is not really a thing here. So people wouldn't be interested in in the same story and i don't i haven't come across any dutch stories on the first world war uh, in my time here i mean there sure must be some uh, i just must have missed them but the fact that i that i was able to miss them where i couldn't have if i lived in belgium already says that you know whichever culture that you live in determines at least partly what is what is um, popular at at that time and what kind of stories you tell and what kind of stories uh, you read. And you wrote about in World War One in the trenches in Flanders in particular, which um, aside from Verdun and Passchendaele is some of the most uh, horrific scenes out of all the world, out of all of World War One. Going back to that kind of cultural memory, people remembering certain things, I was listening to, it was a couple of years ago when it first came out, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast, uh, The Blueprints for Armageddon, the five-part series, which is all about World War One. which if people haven't checked out that, go do it right now. Dan Carlin's incredible. But going back to that cultural memory, he was saying that people in Verdun, sometimes farmers are killed or maimed because they are going through the countryside and they will be plowing and they will come across an artillery shell that hasn't detonated from 
a battle that was over a hundred years ago where you know, untold rounds are fired of artillery. So these people still have a very real sense of what it was like because the threat is still there. And the debt that France had accrued from World War One was only recently paid off too. It's uh, something that's still very real to them. Uh, going back also to what you yeah. were saying about um, simplicity and just like Jacobo was saying with these biblical films, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, I think, like you were saying, people kind of crave that simplicity because you literally have somebody coming down from the mountain with ten rules for you. And if you just do these ten things, you're good to go. And like you were saying, making that comparison today in 2021 with why people are maybe one of the reasons they're getting more interested in the romanticized chivalric stories that have been told for a long time now is that a lot of people maybe feel that kind of disenfranchisement that that sense of belonging you don't know just because your dad is a smithy or a blacksmith doesn't mean you are going to be one as well in 2021 that doesn't mean anything whereas back then it was much more solid it was written in stone in some cases that this is what you would do you may not have liked it you may not have been very good at it or maybe you're incredible at it but you had a sense of maybe not destiny but just a, a very clear grasp and understanding because life was simpler but um, weird history which is a youtube channel i like to go to i would recommend people if they are romanticizing that period in time to watch weird history's video on uh, medieval hygiene and that will definitely give you a uh, Something to think about if you're really romanticizing the area. I found out about lice parties where they would just have people come together and pick each other's hair and get lice and everything out of it. Not quite as romantic as some people would like to think. Well, here is a question I have to ask because perhaps I'm guilty of it and we'll find out if you are too. So, Jacobo, starting with you, what aspects of history do you feel comfortable altering in order to better suit your plot? Okay, that's a fun question. <laughs> so, all right, so naturally there are no rules for anyone to follow. You can have your story take place very loosely in history. Um, you can have your story essentially be a borderline documentary of history with a few changes. Uh, when it comes to the type of history that I like making, and I want to say I have been more dogmatic with some works uh, than others when it comes to fidelity to history. Uh, in my own case, when it comes to my novels, when it comes to some of my short stories, one, it depends on what I am writing. If I'm writing something that is meant to be supernatural, let's say, I might take some more fantastic liberties because the story itself is impossible. It could not have happened. <laughs> so that's a, a short story I wrote recently called Sleep Dead. It's about a, uh, it was about a detective in the 1950s who um, actually did investigate um, all these real life unsolved mysteries in Hollywood and Los Angeles. And um, in the story, he basically is a detective who solved these crimes by lucid dreaming. And he found all the murderers and he gave them the choice to either be killed by him or commit suicide. When it comes to mm -hmm. that, because lucid dreaming is a little, I mean, I know in the last um, podcast we did, I talked about how I practiced it. It is something that opens the opportunity for sort of a dream world in what is a historical fiction. So for that, I took creative liberties with that. It was for a collection of horror. So I took a little bit more freedom in the story. I had him killing all these murderers who in real life were simply per uh, perpetrated unsolved crimes. When it comes to my novels, um, License to Quill or the Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, those stories themselves were completely impossible. I mean, I have President Taft flying over to the UK just to beat up a bunch of people on a weekend because <laughs> someone told him he has to lose weight. So he flies over to the British Isles and beats up an Englishman and a Welshman and an Irishman and a Scotsman in one bare knuckle fight. Now, of course, of course. But when it came to that, I tried to get the silliness of the story, which the story was meant to be silly. It was meant to be fun. I tried to anchor that story so much in history, and I, I dotted the book with footnotes and actual letters and communications, and I researched so much of the period, 
that I wanted readers to actually scratch their heads over how much of this was real and hunt how much of it was not real. And, you know, and the cool thing is there's so much fascinating real history that if you pepper a story with that kind of material, you do dizzy your opponent. You're like, mm. wait a minute, wait a minute. We had robotic automatons in the 1770s? <laughs> Wait a minute, the first lady of the United States, Nellie Tapp, she was a surfer? If you throw that real history in there, it can make some of the more silly aspects actually seem less far-fetched. Yeah, so when it comes to my stories that I've done, and as I said before, uh, my preface, there are no rules when it comes to this. Anyone can do whatever they want. What I try to do is I try to come up with the craziest, most ridiculous situations possible. I'm talking like Indiana Jones adventures or James Bond-esque spy thrillers. I try to imagine first and foremost the craziest story that I can put in history and then I just do all this research I can to make it not only sound plausible but to show that with a little bit of entertaining some of the real history that took place that this crazy story that i invented might have actually happened mm -hmm. without anybody noticing i think you nailed it like one of the goals of uh, historical fiction authors is to get people to go pick up a book and ask themselves wow did that really happen and i think that is part of the fun of reading it as well is whether you're reading something like even alternative history you go how much of this is based in fact so I think that is really important because I don't know about the rest of you, but as myself as a historical fiction author, I really think part of my goal is to educate my reader, not to have massive expository sections of the book where I just unload a ton of history, but to just drop little breadcrumbs here and there and say, yeah, let's see if you go Google that. I think that's a lot of fun. And I think that can be one of the more compelling and exciting parts of reading historical fiction. I especially think that for modern audiences that are so plugged in and where people want to know backstory, they want to see fan art to see what these characters look like. If you're doing historical fiction, we already know who these people were. We knew where they lived and where they died. We know what they died of. Mm -hmm. Like we know how they wrote, we know what their voices are. So as a writer, I just feel that, you know, it frees me from so much imagination in, in a good way. Because yeah. when I was writing that first book, I actually knew the names of the Secret Service agents who were protecting President Taft at the White House. I didn't have to think, well, is this a believable name? Is that fine? No, I just went on Google Books, found out who was working that day. And I did that throughout <laughs> the entire world during that time. If there's a scene where the U.S. Marshals show up, I go, well, which U.S. Marshal would have shown up in Connecticut? And I go on Google Books, I find this little log of like the federal government from 1911. And mm. I'm like, oh, so that's the guy's name. That would have been his beat. He would have been the character who would have showed up during that time. That's awesome. Do you find that when you just see a name for maybe a Secret Service agent, the name in of itself suddenly just gives you a character? Let me put it this way. Um, one of the major, one of the four main characters in the great Abraham Lincoln pocket watch conspiracy, his name was Major Archibald Butt, and he died on the Titanic. So I wow. thought, all right, well, he's going in the story, and I need to give him a fantastic ending. And it turns out he was an incredible person. He He's buried in Arlington. I'm not joking. He actually has a fountain at the White House called the Butt Fountain. Uh, that kind of stuff writes itself. Yeah. Did you, and I have to ask too, and then uh, I think uh, Olha has a question here. Did you mention at any point that but was going to go on a really extraordinary cruise very soon? He was a ma His name was Major Archibald. His nickname was Archie, but he's a real guy. Google him, fascinating figure from Augusta, Georgia. I mean, I don't want to spoil too much of it, but yes, the... Let me put it, the Titanic is on the cover of the book for a reason. Awesome. Well, you had a question. I have, I have one question, but it's 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 it goes back to the, the previous topic. I don't know. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's about, I, I was wondering about all your thoughts on this concept of simplicity and going back to the earlier times, because I thought, well, maybe it's partly because we're looking for simple answers in life, though I think that even before life was never simple. And mm. I think even as a, a farmer just in the country, probably you had your own complicated life. But I was also thinking if the fact that the world is changing and that, um, you know, especially in Europe, we've always had this sense of, this is our culture, we'll just, mm. this, 
where the white people are ruling and um, we have this glorious past and that's changing because we're asking a lot of questions about our own past and I'm also sort of wondering and I'm really curious about your thoughts about this if this is also playing a role that we're harking back to times when western culture was this great magnificent thing when people weren't asking this this hard questions yeah i think uh the simplicity that we were experiencing for generations really you know the idea of manifest destiny in the united states for example was such a such a simplistic purely delusional idea it was so easy and i think this is one of the things why it was so successful it's just so easy for people to say we have a divine right to keep moving west across North America until we hit the ocean. And again, that simplicity, I think for a lot of people, whether they feel they are conflicted as to what they're to do with their life or not, the idea, especially of an authoritative figure saying, go west, you can have 20 acres, 200 acres all to yourself if you can settle it and survive. For some people, that is just a... Uh, it's like a get out of jail free card for some people. I don't know. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? That's just my two cents. I mean, I do think that psychologically that humans naturally crave some sort of order compared to disorder. Uh, you know, it's the reason why we see faces in rocks or clouds if they look a certain way. I mean, for whatever evolutionary reason, I'm sure there's you know wiser people out there, anthropologists or biologists who can explain it better than I can. But I mean, we naturally, there's only so much that the human brain can process. So we use heuristic reasonings. We try to simplify things. And as you become an adult and you learn more and you venture out into the real world, you may crave for the more simplistic ideas, even if they be prejudicial or bigoted, what have you. I mean, it is a lot easier to think about a world where things operate in a very binary good or evil right or wrong you know kind of way mm -hmm. all right our new next uh same question to you what aspects of history do you feel comfortable altering in order to better suit your plot i think in a way um it harkens back back to the first question you asked on rules mm -hmm. um for me personally because i interpreted that question not so much as what rules does a story have to adhere to before it's called uh, historical fiction, but sort of what rules do you adhere to when you're writing um, historical fiction? And that respect thing has a lot to do with what parts am I comfortable in changing or editing when I feel the story uh, needs it. And I think in that also, again, context is king. If I'm writing a story for um, a museum website, it has, it has to have a different level of historical accuracy than if I'm writing something that borders the line between historical fiction and speculative fiction, for example. I think that, that there's different there's different contexts uh, there which allow for difference um, in, in alteration. Um, and for the first one, you would be much closer to what really happened. And for the second one, um, I think there's, there's an Australian notorious criminal called Chopper Reed, who once said, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And, you know, I can see the point of that in some instances as well. Personally, I enjoy finding out more about periods of history and people that lived in history. I think um, the example that Jacopo gave about, about Major but it's a brilliant example because it shows that if you take the effort to do to do your proper research and to see what it was like and to see who these people were. History itself has a tendency to give you a wealth of fantastic ideas and, and great people to play with that otherwise you might not have thought of. I think another another thing in what am I comfortable in altering or not altering is the realization that I don't believe that history is an exact science, and I believe that history or telling history or historical fiction or whatever, you always, your story always has a message. And I think that um, as I've grown older, I've become more acutely aware of what that message is. Um, and that also corresponds, I think, with what Olga said earlier 
about whose story it is that you can talk about whose story is not your story so you should let someone else talk about it and 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 in that i think that plays an important role on on why i would alter things or not i think you make a good point about whose story is not your story to tell that's an excellent point it, it's sort of in a way it relates to and uh, i'm sorry I, I don't know if what olga was going to say on this because she also has um some great on ideas on this, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, mow the lawn before he gets by. But I think things like cultural appropriation are an important aspect in this, and in itself, it's a neutral term. But you have to be really aware of what you're doing with it, and as a dominant culture, you have to know that if you change certain things or if you tell certain people's stories, you take their power away, you take their story away. And that's really not on. <laughs> and we as a white Western, you know, capitalist patriarchy have done that for far too long. And, and so I think in that regard, what you, what you tell, you have, to, you have to be really certain of why you're telling it. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm trying to tell a story about events in Tunisia after the Third Punic War, you know, just regular old white guy. And I kind of wonder, is it my story to tell? It being so far in the past, I think that there's, it's almost like statute of limitations. Like I think enough time has passed where I think it's okay for me to tell that story. But I take a lot of care, I put a lot of research into it. And I do keep up with a few Tunisian historians who are very conscious of the fact that the Berbers, the Carthaginians, the Roman influence in that part of the world is still very much embedded in the culture, it's in the architecture, it's in the language. And so making sure that we're paying homage and being respectful while still ultimately trying to tell our own story is a bit of a juggling act, but it can be done. And I think in a lot of cases it should be done. And those are stories that ought to be told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I think if, if you take the care to involve people, then that gives you a range of what stories you can tell and and um, that can help you out in, in situations where, where you do find it difficult. And I, I think in this regard, it's never bad to ask for help. I don't know if I can, I can plug another, another website or, or another sure. uh, um, service here, but for one, of, for one of our stories, which is set in the 19th century, we went to Salt and Sage Books, and they have um, excellent experts on um, different cultures of different basically ethnicities just a whole diverse mm -hmm. kind of, of and ethnography yeah and, and and we went and said okay we want to talk about this we want to have it play a part in our story and our story is is, is not telling their story but it, it is a part of it can you help and people are often quite quite willing and quite Happy to help. Jacobo, you had something to add to the conversation? Yes, I did. Uh, simply because um, uh, simply because I heard Major Buck get mentioned and also going out to help. I had an interesting situation when I was doing my research for that book because I sought a lot of help. Historians, experts, I wouldn't have been able to write the book so quickly if it wasn't for them. And one group I reached out to was GLAD, the uh, Gay and Lesbian Anti-Defamation League, because mm -hmm. we have very good reason to believe that um, Major Butt was a closeted homosexual, mm. which um, I did want to address in the book because uh, not only is it part of his character, but he was the chief military advisor to back-to-back -to -back Republican presidents. Mm. I wanted to show 100 years ago that, you know, there were people like this in some of the highest echelons in the U.S. government and the Republican Party. Hmm. So I reached out to um, a representative of GLAD over in uh, New York City, and I was talking about this book I was researching, and I said, I have this character in there, Major Butt. And um, the person at the end of the line was not too happy with the Major's name. Hmm. And I said, no, no, no I, he's not a fictional character. That's his actual name. And he goes, really? Go, yeah, his name was Major Butt. Major Archibald Archie Butt died heroically on the Titanic. He's buried in Arlington. And then I heard a pause where I think... Um, the person at the end of the line was doing some searching online, and then I just heard, why did he have to have that name? <laughs> so then the question comes, do I change the character's name? Right. Hell no. Yeah. No, no, he, I, I'm, no one in the entire book had a different name for whatever reason. 
And I have heard more than once that when it comes to some historical fiction, there have been times when, more so in cinema, where some screenwriters have literally changed history to make it sound more believable mm -hmm. than that of, than compared to how fantastic it was. But um, I didn't want to in this case. It's the kind of thing where history was my sword and shield, and I was hiding behind the shield when it came to any criticism with his name. Well, I appreciate that authenticity. I mean, the historical record, I think, is it's sacred in a lot of ways. And telling my story, I haven't deviated from who these people are, their names, their beliefs. I mean, the ancient world was a harsh one, um, but it was also a very diverse one in terms of sexual norms and things of that nature. So I don't shy away from it, but I, I do have my shield braced and at the ready. Olha, same question to you. What aspects of history do you feel comfortable altering in order to better suit your plot? Well, first of all, I really love the answers before this. And I think this thing that you're just looking for certain fa facts and that history is just weirder than anything you can think of that just that's, I think, what I really love about writing historical fiction. Um, as for the parts uh, about altering, um, I think that because a lot of my work is uh, starts with themes or um, uh, social issues that I find really important. I think that's always a starting point for me and certain stories in history just click with that because people were fighting for the same kind of uh, issues or their lives were in line with, uh, with the story I'm trying to tell. And I think I'm always conscious of, and I think that's, this is what Arnett also said, is the story that you're telling, is it in line with uh, someone's life or the things that happened? And if so, I feel comfortable altering certain aspects of it. Because I think overall you're uh, respecting someone's life or a certain time uh, in that way. I think uh, there was a discussion recently um, about uh, Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. Mm. about um, the polyamorous uh, relationship of Professor Marston and uh, the two women in his life. He was the one who uh, thought up uh, Wonder Woman. And um, it was really interesting because in the movie, uh, it's, it's, it's a, 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 the, the, there's a three-person relationship. And I happen to be in a three-person relationship mm. also with two women and a man. And uh, the women are depicted as having uh, a sexual relationship. And the children said, well, this was not the case. And this, uh, so this movie is uh, incorrect and they're not, this, is, this was not what life was for us. And um, a lot of people said, well, <laughs> blame the screenwriter for you have to honor those facts. And I was thinking about it and thinking, well, the main point I think of this movie is uh, about uh, how society deals with different relationships and uh, yeah. even in 2021 as <laughs> as we're now uh, i can tell you that being in a different relationship is really hard and there's a lot of prejudice and a lot of rules against you and um you're still living you can uh, come in quite difficult and uh, potentially dangerous situations and children in these relationships are not protected the same as in monogamous um, marriages and i thought because the, the movie was making such a point of, of of that how hard it is to be different i thought i don't really mind that they uh, added this layer it uh, it added a bit of sweetness to the story made it a bit, I don't know, it, it made it really interesting, I think. It mm -hmm. gave a really dynamic relationship. So I really understood that decision because it was so in line, I think, with the lives of these people. So I understand that, yeah, the facts <laughs> were different. Yeah. And I think, Arnaud, you said something similar, which is that it's contextual when we tell these stories and that it's also kind of genre-based in that some people, like my, myself, it's historical fantasy. So I feel like there are certain things I can change, and uh, but there are certain things that I feel like I mentioned earlier, maybe personalities and preferences that I feel like ought to stay the same. Whereas Olha, you're talking about maybe certain things that are actually more compelling when we do change them. And I think it really is just everybody said in their own way, directly or otherwise, it's very contextual. Yeah, yeah I think so too. 
Yeah. And ne next to that, uh, Arnett was talking about cultural appropriation. Hmm. And I think recently I have a really big interest in sort of reclaiming uh, history because, um, well, I have this obsession with the golden age. I'm sorry if I keep talking about yeah, it. It's and, all right. And <laughs> edit it out if it gets boring. No. But because from such an early age, we're taught as children here about what a great explorers we were. And they were always men. It mm -hmm. was always the, the, the white man with the white colors doing the great stuff. And we're not talking about the First World War and things like that. But the Golden Age is, wow, that's like everything we have. And recently, there have been a lot of discussions here about some of these major figures that we have in history, like um, Jan Pieterson Koen is a really uh, good example as somebody who made the Dutch East India Company very rich, but also did a lot of genocide mm. things. So it's, it's um, and he has a lot of statues here. Uh, so for one of my projects, I also do drag. So I dress up as a man. Mm. So I thought, there was something in my brain tickled me and I thought, what if I, as a woman, take on this role of these famous uh, Golden Age characters? So I started doing that and writing about them because a lot of the people don't know the actual facts behind uh, these figures. They, all, they only know the, 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 the good deeds and mm -hmm. not about the killings. And, um, and, and I was thinking about it. First, I felt really... Well, I thought it's not my place because these were real people. And, you know, before I'd be talking about respect and respecting people's lives. But in this part, I feel I can do that. Uh, I can dress up as one of those men and tell about the, the parts in history that I think we should know and that are not as brilliant and golden as we would like them to be. Uh, but I got a lot of backlash on that, especially from men who thought it was not my place to criticize um, these kind of figures. While I still think <laughs> that I can, so it's I don't know. It's um, I still I still feel comfortable with the role because, in some way, I have the feeling I'm punching up because mm -hmm. I'm a figure as a queer woman. I'm a figure who has been left out of history all of the time. And now I feel like I can reclaim a bit of that history somehow. Yeah, really just like you're saying, feeling like you're punching up and, you know, there's never been a better time, I think, because we're finally having a lot of much needed discussions to present kind of like with Hamilton that Jacobo had mentioned earlier. There's never been a better time to portray things in a different light that highlights a lot of the less than savory facts about these idealized figures were giving that warts and all portrayal and a lot of people are not okay with it and that's tough tough for them i mean the part of being a historian or writing historical fiction is sometimes deciding that you know genghis khan did a lot of things some people think he's a great man but he committed genocide on a scale that wasn't rivaled for hundreds of years you don't have to like that, but you do have to acknowledge it happened. And that's something I really try and impress on people when I talk to them about histories. You don't have to like it, but it is worth acknowledging. We need to yeah. incorporate that in how do we look at all of our historical figures. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, I think I find it really interesting also in Hamilton, but we also saw, this is not really historical fiction, but uh, the Cthulhu series. Yeah. But where... Um, there's also a sort of retelling of parts of history with just uh, with black women, black women who are uh, where there's parts of history where there's just reclaimed by black people, and I think that's so strong. Mm -hmm. Just as and I I can't really describe why, but I have the same feeling as as a woman just reclaiming a part of history where I've always been left out. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, think, talking about certain was, authors who Lovecraft want to. Uh, yeah, Lovecraft Country, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things about Lovecraft that people don't want to acknowledge. Uh, racism is top of the list. Arnaud, what is it about historical fiction that you feel compelled to write about? What is it that just, you've got to write these stories, you've got to tell the world about historical figures and events? I think historical fiction is a different way of looking at ourselves and it's a way of writing about what it is to be human 
because history says so much about who we are. And um, even though the way someone, say, in the Middle Ages or someone in the, the 16th century may have expressed their fears or their desires or their jealousy or their anger. They may have expressed it differently. They're all human emotions and those haven't mostly changed uh, because we're still, we're still humans. We're still the same. Um, we just express it different. Uh, other, we find different solutions or different answers. Well, we think we we adhere to, but underneath we're all we're all human, and I think that was that's what compels me to write to write about history because it compels me to write about what it is to be human, and and the stories that I like to tell or the stories that I like to write about they have a a recurring theme of a recurring human theme of having an oppressive system and finding your own voice um, against that, struggling with the world around you, struggling with yourself and, and those human struggles, they haven't changed in history, but history gives us a different perspective on them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I find it, I find it fascinating. Um, and I, for me personally, I find it very, in a way, very comforting to have that connection with all these generations that have gone before me to know that all these people have been there. They've suffered in, in similar ways or worse ways or thought about the same things or wanted the same things, had the same disappointments, had the same type of victories. And it's sort of, it's for me, it connects. And I find that connection through time. And I find that very, very comforting. It also find it very hopeful so the the why that's why i am compelled to write it and that's why my my stories often have that sort of that same theme because i think a part of what history writing is and and whether it's historical fiction or whether it's history in that you get thought that's cool it's most of the time it's propaganda it's you mm -hmm. choose what history you tell and you choose what history you don't tell and uh, you know um in holland Again, the, that golden age, we choose to tell that we are explorers. We don't, we choose not to tell all the horrible things that we did. That also influences how we are today and how we think of ourselves. And, and I like to have a sort of a contra sound voice that says, look, there's always been people that, that struggle against the way the world exploits people. There's always people that struggle with the same struggles that you struggle with. And, and and find that connection. Yeah, I think the uh, the human story is by and large a pretty hopeful one. It's like the uh, celebration in World War One between the I believe it was the French and the Germans at uh, Christmas Eve, where they just put their guns down and celebrated and sang Christmas carols to one another across the trenches, amidst one of the most yeah, horrific and even battles. Yeah, they had a soccer match. Yeah, they had a soccer match uh, in that film Joyeux Noël. That's an excellent little film if you'd like to learn more about that pretty unique instance in uh, human history. All right, Olha, same question to you. What is it about historical fiction that you feel so compelled to write about? Well, I think I agree mostly with Arnaud. I also have to think uh, about what Joseph Campbell said when somebody asked him, why do you study myth or why should we learn about all these storytelling and myth? And, uh, and he said, well, you can just go on and live your life and don't, 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 don't mind these stories. You really don't have to learn them, but then you're just inventing the wheel all over again, <laughs> because everything you're going to feel, every thing you're going to do in your life, somebody has done it before you. And they've told you stories about what problems you're going to encounter and uh, how, how you can solve them. And I think with history, it's the it's basically the same. I know historians really hate it when you say that you can learn from history <laughs> and that we just have to look back to find the answers for today, because I know that's not how it works. But I think there's uh, when other people turn to self-help books, I always turn to history because mm. I think whether I'm struggling with oppression or gender or whatever, there have been hundreds of people before me who have struggled uh, with the same questions and that really comforts me. I also think that writing about history 
a broadens your perspective. I think we have this bias of thinking that we are here today because we are some sort of winners or something. <laughs> we have the answers. I don't know. We we made it this far. And this is the best version the world can be. And I don't think that's true. I think we're living in waves of going forward and backward and struggling. And every time I, I pick up historical research, I'm reminded that this is just a set of choices we made that aren't necessarily the best choices. I'm reading a lot about marriage and the history of marriage recently for one of my books. And the fact that we are marrying for love is just, it's a choice. It's also a political choice. And it's not better or worse than marrying for economic reasons and saying, well, which uh, I, my, my love life is different from my married life because in my married life, I'm just trying to get as I get as far in life as I can be in, in, in terms of resources and family ties. And, and I think, yeah, when, when you really look at it, there is a lot of against uh, arguments and, and pro arguments for all these sides. And um, so I think um, for perspective, it's really nice. And I think uh, what Jacobo said earlier, that there's so many crazy, fantastical people who lived before us. And these stories are just worth telling uh, because some, sometimes when I read up on people, I think my life is so boring. This person at 20 had seen half the world, traveled to six continents, had 30 marriages, and here I am in Soest, <laughs> just on, a, on an attic writing something. My life is so boring. So I don't know. It's also, I just like the just a fantastical aspect of it. Well, comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, but I totally agree with you. Um, history doesn't always repeat, but it sure as hell rhymes. And that we can learn a lot and also understand that history, I would say civilization, hasn't been on an upward trend since the Neolithic Revolution and agriculture and all those things started to take place. This has been kind of a roller coaster. And case in point is the fall of the roman empire and how that set back western year uh western europe hundreds of years yeah and i think even after the roman empire i don't think that the early medieval europe was also a really fascinating place and they mm -hmm. also had <laughs> they were ahead of us on a lot of other aspects so it's always and i was recently reading about a, a kind of silk that they made i think 150 years ago and it had a, an enormous thread count I think of 10,000, so it's really fine mm. silk. And with all our mo modern machinery, we just can't replicate it. Mm -hmm. the, the max we can get is like 3,000, and that's enormous for us. So it always humbles me to look at history and think with all our modern inventions, we just, we can't get it back. It's, mm -hmm. they, they were ahead of us on so many, uh, so many aspects. Yeah, that's so many people still puzzle over how the uh, pyramids were made. Yeah. It's hard for us to believe that people 5,000 years ago could do such incredible things. And let's see, Jacopo, same question to you. What is it about historical fiction that you feel so compelled to write about? I think one of the great things about historical fiction and really hist you know, history in general is history applies to every single person. It belongs to everyone. There's no disclaimer that says, all right, this history belongs to that human, this history belongs to that family. It is ultimately all sh it is all shared, you know, all part of the same cloth. So I do feel that for everyone, there's always going to be that connection. I also think that there is an awesome power when it comes to fin the, the finality of history. History is history. Past. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that we can't change unless you're delving into the fiction. So this gives us what seems like an awesome power. We can destroy the pyramids if we want. Mm. We can have Napoleon win at Waterloo. We can change history however we want as storytellers, which for an audience is a seemingly awesome, incredible power. It's something that no one can be able to do. At least not yet. Maybe one day we'll be able to change history. But um, so from a, from a storyteller point of view, because I do view, and also from a reader, uh, from the point of view of a reader, I do view history as something that basically everyone owns, everyone shares in, and that it's something that affects all of us. So for that reason, I view any type of historical fiction as a reinterpretation 
of our history and thus an interpretation of ourselves mm -hmm. because it doesn't take much imagination for you know this little change in history to create a world where we didn't exist anymore or where you know um, our parents could not have existed or where we never immigrated to this one country or this injustice was never done to that uh, what have you it affects our biography people will always be humbled by that which unquestionably is more powerful than them the biggest egomaniac in the world is never going to escape the fact that the ocean is more powerful than them that mountains are taller than them and that's how history is history is fourth dimensional when it comes to its awe and its strength and when it comes to historical fiction we don't actually change history but we get to toy with it a little bit <laughs> so it's our way of playing god <laughs> couldn't say it better yeah i've got nothing or should to i say to playing chronos <laughs> yes thank you thank you for uh, adapting that to me this has been an absolute delight for me thank you all for joining the historical fiction panel and now we are going to go to questions from our audience.